But lads, uh, it's rare for me to make one of these sort of dev diary videos, but uh, I've been waiting a while for this. So we've had seven weeks of uh, dev diaries for the road to uh, E4 1.35. If you don't know, E4 is getting another update soon, which is going to be focusing on older nations. It's introducing some new idea groups, but also revamping existing nations such as, you know, the Ottomans, China, Japan, Russia, France. So today I'm going to be taking you through each of the dev diaries so far. Starting off, we have the roadmap to 1.35. First most important thing is the fact that we have three new idea groups. We've got infrastructure ideas, court ideas, and mercenary ideas. So starting off with infrastructure ideas, it looks like they're taking inspiration from economic ideas, which did, to be fair, occupy this weird space between being economic and also development. And it looks like they've taken the development side of things out of economic ideas and put it into, uh, into this one. So we've got development cost, which is pretty standard for this sort of uh, infrastructure ideas. It'd be strange if it didn't occur. Prosperity, growth, and state modern basis modify, pretty decent build cost and build time. Also pretty good. Envoy travel time, I'm not really too fussed with, uh, but that global autonomy is looking quite nice. Fort Mason's modifier, always handy and allowed number of buildings plus one. Uh, one is actually good for the late game. So unless I'm misreading that, uh, it does look like a pretty solid idea group, particularly if you're gonna be playing tall. I think one of the main issues I have with playing tall in E4 is it can be a little bit dull, I think more flavor and idea groups like this would make it a lot more fun. And obviously all of that comes with the intersection between uh, these idea groups and the, uh, the already existing ones, creating some decent policies. I particularly like this one here. Uh, that's quite a nice one for colonial development. And also this years for personal uh, union integration minus 10 is really nice. Now this to me is the most interesting one, the core ideas, because as you can see, the idea is to introduce some internal flavor, something that I think uh, as someone who generally plays quite wide uh, is missing in the game. So. Uh, being able to manipulate your estates, as it says there, being able to sort of have more direct control over your nation and the internal workings of it is pretty good. So we have sort of the legitimacy side of things at the end as a bonus. We have power projection from insults. Sure, again, not too fast. All estate loyalty, equilibrium makes sense. It would be that and a decent uh, one to boot reform progress. I enjoy that because now that we've got more options with regards to government reforms, I think it's a great thing to try and chase down reform progress. I haven't seen many people commenting on the fact that one of the main benefits of playing tool is that you get through your government reforms quicker, giving you more powerful bonuses uh, because it's not like it's a gradual thing. It's one day you have no government reforms and the next day you have plus 15% manpower. It's not a sliding scale. So hitting those reforms are quite useful. Bear in mind, if I say anything wrong during this video, I do want you to correct me uh, in the comments down below. For these sorts of dev diaries, it's good to all, as a community, community give feedback. That's what these things are here for. It's our chance to give input to the devs before something goes live. See, national focus is minus five. I do like that. A monthly splendor, also quite nice. Having said that, I, the age bonuses themselves, I can't be the only one that thinks we should get more age bonuses. They're not, they, they were fun when they first came out. I, I'm not too fussed with ages right now. Prestige, that's okay. I mean, I like it as a group and I like the uh, the policies, but I think it, it's just a bit weak in comparison uh, to the existing idea groups. Obviously they're reworking some of them now, but the policies are good. You've got the core creation cost here. You've got no stability loss on monarch death which I think is quite nice. So I think the policies are really what sell this idea group, to me at least. And then finally, you've got mercenary ideas, which, as it might suggest, are focusing on mercenaries. Uh, and again, it's just another way to, to play tool. I, I think one of the most fun campaigns I've ever had was playing as the Swiss and renting out my uh, condottieri to everyone and everything. Definitely a different way of playing the game and certainly a fun one as well, uh, as well as being very historically uh, relevant because that's just what the Swiss did. There we can see possible condottieri and uh, mastery discipline, always nice. Mastery cost, mastery maintenance modifier, what else would it be? Mill advisor cost minus 25% um, is really good. Quite like that. And available province loot and loot amount, I also like that as well. To so basic land morale, um, some reserves organization, which is an interesting one, and mastery manpower. Overall, a really, really good idea group, I think. As well as the fact that you can combine it over here to create client state, something that isn't unlocked until like 23 or 24. Dip tech. So being able to do that early. For those of you don't know what client state is, is you can create a province and then just turn it into a vassal. You know, the province of, for example, Paris can just be a vassal, uh, which is great because it just allows more flexibility with regards to your foreign policy, which is a fun way of saying you can click different buttons. So here are the tweaks to the existing idea groups, which I think are quite important to note. Removing the stability cost uh, modifier and replacing with the release unity and release ideas, I think that's a great change. It didn't make sense to have stability cost modifier in the first place, in my opinion. Uh, admin ideas, it's removed all the mercenary based stuff and replaced it with admin advisor cost, good. Uh, religious stability cost modifier, Modifier, kind of an interesting one, uh, and states governing costs. So basically, they've made admin more admin focused because admin was this weird mixture between administrative and also a mercenary idea group. So there's that. Now, economic ideas, uh, obviously, a lot of crossover with infrastructure ideas or what we thought were infrastructure ideas. Here we have monthly gold inflation and 25% uh, gold depletion chance, which is 
excellent, I think. I, I quite like it. As you see, as he said, uh, this is a niche change and we'd welcome some feedback on it. I think it's good. Not every idea is always going to be entirely relevant to every single playthrough. Maybe I'm in the minority when I say that's a good thing. It means that your future playstyle will be altered by previous decisions. And why do I think that's important? Well, I'm a big fan of dynamism, right? And, and different playthroughs being informed by your own decision making. So if you have taken economic ideas, you suddenly have an inbuilt in-game incentive to go and chase down gold mines. Suddenly you're going after West Africa or uh, you're going for a colonial game in Mexico or you're going for the Kilwa in East Africa because you know that you can get a huge amount of benefit from those gold mines. And that's based on a decision that you took maybe 50 years previously. I really like that when future decisions are informed by your previous one. But I can understand why people might be a bit annoyed by it. Development cost replaced with 10 goods plus modifier. I think they need to make economic ideas a little bit stronger because this was obviously the most powerful thing that people take economic ideas for. When creating a new idea group, it's hard to sort of balance it such that it's not just making one completely irrelevant and now everyone just goes to the future one. So on top of that, they've also got new events when it comes to idea groups, which I think is great. One of the strengths of EU4 is, uh, as I was saying before, the dynamism, uh, the fact that you have have flavor and if you've picked certain idea groups that intersect with other idea groups you'll get events so i think it's a great thing that they've reworked that so that is the first dev diary all focused on the new uh, idea groups themselves and sort of sets up the idea that well, more content is coming now we look at something that i'm not going to spend too much time on because it's quite niche and uh it's not relevant to the wider eu for audience <laughs> unit pips i also am aware that some people don't even know what these things do so each of your military troops has uh, defensive or offensive pips that relate to how well they do in combat. General idea is that more pips, better, right? Um, and since the Leviathan DLC, the Polynesians had the best troops in the world. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but they did. And so they've rebalanced it and changed them to be more in line with American and Africans, which is great um, because they were just kind of stupid. Um, MP players will be looking at this more than anything else. Um, in all these dev diaries because this matters quite a lot when you're trying to min-max your nation. I think it's also worth mentioning to a wider EU4 audience that if you didn't know already, there are bigger disparities at different time periods between different uh, technology groups, right? For example, you can see here, the Anatolian group will keep one of their big spike pips on Tech 12. So at Tech 12, the Anatolians have better troops than anyone else. Or at the start of the game, if you're, for example, playing as Morocco, you could take advantage of the fact that Muslim infantry is better and cavalry um, or at least their, their troops are better than, uh, for example, their Iberian counterparts. Right at the end of the game, the late game, Western troops are better. That's why, for example, uh, Russia, France, and these other nations can just steamroll the Ottomans uh, in the late game because, frankly, there's just such a disparity between them. However, at Tech 12, if you've ever noticed the Ottomans just go a bit crazy, it's because they have way better troops than everyone else with the already existing uh, benefits they get from their uh, national ideas. They have also buffed the Muslim tech group, which I think is quite needed because, as you can see here, they suffered from both uh, very poor offensive and defensive fire pips. Uh, they do have good uh, shock and morale. So just to be clear, uh, pips are divided into three sections. You have morale, which is morale, and then uh, fire and shock phase. If you didn't know, uh, battle in E4 is split into two phases, the fire phase and the shock phase. Fire phase obviously uses everyone's fire pips, which is why uh, cannons are super important. And they have ridiculously a uh, good fire rate and they fire from the back row. Also, the fire phase comes first. That's why I made a video, for example, doing artillery only. And you can walk through with a pure artillery army and just melt everything in front of you because the fire phase comes first. So yeah, I will leave a link to all of this in the description, but this right here uh, explains all of the hip changes that you could possibly want. I think it is worth mentioning that uh, they've labeled these things the defensive. I hate that it highlights in yellow, that's horrible. Um, but they've named them the defensive version and they are accepting suggestions for naming each unit type. So if you want to get involved, this is a great way to do it. Just naming things. Harness that power for good, lads. You and me, <laughs> we can we could make the game a lot better. And now we move on to a couple of mission trees, which I'm very, very, very excited about. I do want to take a moment at this point to discuss EU5 uh, and, and sort of my thoughts on that matter. Quite frankly, I got the sentiment from PDXCon talking to people that EU5, whilst obviously it is nearer now than it's ever been, because that's how linear time works, uh, it's it's we're not at the point now where we're going to be teasing things or or anything else like that uh, i would be surprised if we hear anything by the end of the year i think at the end of this year maybe but i i, I really don't think so um they might start mentioning it at the end of this year but i still think we have uh, some time left in the eu4 cycle so we don't have eu5 anytime soon which is a shame because you see how my how my views got boosted by victoria 3 god damn i could do with some of that <laughs> an eu5 all right now let's look at the emperor of china side of things so that's gonna be looking at both the ming and the ching but my biggest issue with playing as the ming now is that it's boring it's just not fun so 
it'll be interesting to see if they're able to fix that problem. I think it's worth just me going over these bullet points here. Uh, so the first thing is that they have a brand new fully fleshed out mission tree, uh, a new estate, the Unix. I don't necessarily think that adding a new estate is going to be any good, but we'll see. Uh, obviously, wouldn't give it a chance. Um, as you can see here, as you struggle to curb the influence of the Unix and prevent your historical collapse, it looks to me, and I could be wrong, that the Ming is going to be all about trying not to die, which presents a different kind of playthrough and a rather interesting one at that. So I'm happy to give that a shot. But new decrees, new flavor events, deep modability, which is always good and a new great project that spans several provinces. Now that is interesting. Okay, so the mission tree, uh, we've got some of the existing stuff like Tomb of Crisis, Nomadic Frontier, repeal or improve Hajin. I'm afraid I'm not the best uh, educated on uh, East Asian history <laughs> when it comes to China at least. So um, I would give a lot of this stuff is gonna be new to me. Autonomy will across our provinces will remain high until we reduce it either by missions, events, or decisions. Interesting. Now this is dangerous though, because whilst I do like the idea of Ming being this huge beast that has high autonomy, so you have to unlock the potential of your nation, I think that's great. How do you counterbalance that with someone like Oira that can just sort of march and take out the Ming. We'll see, I guess is the best way to describe that. Autonomy of the province of the empire will increase at a minimum of plus 25%. Which I like. The eunuchs are a powerful body of advising the emperor, will gain and lose power depending on the state of internal affairs, as well as the abilities of the emperor itself. To me, it feels like we're coming out with a theme with E4 1.35, which is the sentiment of, of managing your nation, which sounds kind of obvious when you think about it. The eunuchs will offer a vast array of very powerful estate privileges, most of which will scale with their internal power in the form of crown land and controlled as shown. Yes, they will start with nearly 60% crown land. Oh my God. Now, me personally, I don't like giving any power to the estates whatsoever. Um, I'm very careful. I have the same set of like estate privileges that I do every time. And that's something that I don't like about the estate system as it currently stands, is that there is some degree of like difference uh, between different nations uh but very rarely do you stray from like the existing accepted i don't want to say meta because it's not really a meta but existing accepted like things that estate privileges that you're comfortable in autonomy it's obviously going to be quite decent possible advisors not worth taking you won't be able to reform your country anywhere near as fast if you do it by crushing the influence of the eunuch but if you do lean on them too much the accumulated cost of fighting their inevitable corruption will become overbearing difficult to manage and you will collapse okay i do i do like that it looks like they've taken inspiration from the uh, livonian order and how the mechanics of, of that work in terms of curtailing and crushing the bishoprics and that sort of stuff. While other estate disasters require you to lower your infants and enact a national decision, I've never had an estate disaster. It's just, it's not that hard to stay alive. will lose one run privilege so as to lower their influence, spawn a special large stack of rebels, and every province this stack of rebel sieges will lower your mandate considerably. God. This loop continues until the estate's influence is either low enough or they have no privileges. You best stick with the disaster. Puts it lightly. Another thing to note is the AI has been told how to not die, but it explodes relatively frequently as it used to, which is good. Uh, I think one of the big criticisms, I can't remember which, Golden Century? Might have been Emperor. After one of those, Ming no longer collapsed. Because early uh, EU4, right? You, you play it and you never saw Ming. By the time you got to, to Asia, it had already collapsed. And I kind of like that. Um, I kind of like the idea of, you know, one in 10 that Ming still exists. My current gripe with the existing system is that there is no typical successor to Ming. It'd be more interesting to see. Uh, we'll see, okay. There was the attempt with the special Chinese unification, Caspelli, but just because of how um, alliances and such work in uh, in the game. You never really see a preeminent power take over the mantle of uh, of Ming. Another interesting thing is that in the missions and the rewards, you can kind of do it like with diplomacy, right? Uh, the idea being that Ming historically didn't really want to conquer stuff because it's already big. Why? What's the point, right? You think geopolitically, what is the? We conquer stuff in EU4 because we want them to grow because we want big name big, right? That's just that's that's a thing, but historically you you conquer for a reason and ming was already thought it was like the best of the best so why would it go and conquer more stuff there's no point so i do like the fact that they've emulated that but also given the option to sort of conquer directly still now the mandate has 10 new reforms which is great well let me put it this way in my time of playing e4 apart from for one video where i was abusing the system to create vassals out of tributaries uh, as ming for like a ridiculously easy world conquest. I never once take the mandate. I never think it's worth it. We'll see if they can try and uh, reconcile that. Now, I'm gonna whiz through and say if I think these are good or not. This one is very good. Technology cost minus 10%. Minimal autonomy, gonna be very, very useful given the, the Ming that we've been given. Over here, mandate growth modify and all the state's loyalty. Doesn't seem that useful unless, of course, you're trying to curtail the, the Unix. I like this. Adds a bit of dynamism to the game. Adds a bit of dynamism to the mandate game. Threes may now be required to be active by submissions. I like that. Forces you down a path. I really enjoy how much Paradox has uh, embraced the mission side of things. I think it happened definitely since uh, Lions of the North and the success of that. They looked at it and thought, this is what people want. Uh, the idea that existing bonuses are enhanced or reduced 
or some things have to be put in place, I think is, is really, really nice. Because again, it's this idea of like nation forming, right? For me, the time period of EU4 is all about what is a na what is a state, right? You have this transition from dynasties and feudal power into the idea of statehood and geopolitics surrounding that. And I think that anything that the game does to reflect that fact is gonna be inherently interesting. It's also worth noting that not only Ming is going to be receiving new content, but also the Jersey Tribes, Manchu and Qing, as well as Chinese Warlords. Like I was saying before, we need something there because right now you can't tell me there's a difference between Shun and Yue. There's just, I don't care about the difference. Chinese Warlords, meaning the releasables of Ming, will also have their own little mission tree, which helps them unite the Chinese land and take up the Mandate of Heaven which is the important part. So just highlighting that to, to show that I think that this could be a really cool thing if it actually does end up, you know, seeing the re reformation of a, of, of, a, of a China, right? The interesting thing here, and I'll, I'll quote it directly, is that every choice will have a different impact at the reforms of Nurhasi, I cannot pronounce that, later in the game. The stats are random, but heavily weighted to be really good across the board. And then I assume you can uh, choose what you want from him. So he's a general with Dragon Tiger, which is such a badass name with 10% movement speed and 10% cavalry combat ability and a 90% reduction cost as a discipline advisor plus 100 mil, which is gonna be very, very useful for attacking the Ming. You have to attack the Ming early, always. Maybe that's not the case in this new, maybe I'm just assuming. That might not be the case in this new patch. I'm The key part is I'm excited and that's important for you four. Also, I really like the seven grievances um, because it outlines the exact reasons why they're going to be fighting the Ming. I'm not sure it's necessary to uh, give Zhang Zhao uh, more combat ability against the Ming. I think that part of the beauty of the, the Qing campaign is that it's still a hard fought war. It's not the Oira where you just instantly win. And I personally think that's too easy. It's it's a hard fought war. You, you have to slaughter tens of thousands of Ming troops. So I don't necessarily think that you should get global attack and dice roll bonus plus one. But I guess they're trying to emulate how cool it is. If that is counterbalanced by more Ming troops, the only way that they could improve the Zhang Zhao versus Ming war is that if Ming is able to summon more troops, but you're able to kill more troops. There is nothing more fun than striding in. Seeing Ming has like 100,000 troops, you have about like 30,000 and you just tear through them. If they can make it such that 200,000 Ming troops versus your 30,000 and it's still an even fight, that would be beautiful. The Qing also has new missions, which I think is going to be great. Uh, we'll see if they are actually any good. Now, I'm glad they've shown off these three things because these are three different aspects of EU4 and the new direction that I think EU4 is taking that I really like. So if I can show you each of these, for example, new government tier reforms, that's great. I honestly think that the government reform uh, changed EU4 was one of the best things in recent memory. So to build on that is always going to be good. We have emphasis on banner regiments. So special units being used. Always a fan of that. Well, not always. And you'll see what I mean when it comes to the Japan dev diary, because there was one change with that I do not like. And then we get the dynamic missions, which I think was one of the coolest things that they added. The only thing that I think that this Ming side of things is missing is that I think that they should make Ming ridiculously overpowered. Now stay with me. Don't dislike the video. I think they should make Ming ridiculously overpowered unless they go expansionist. I think that if you go expansionist, just as Ming, you suddenly lose these internal um, modifiers that make you this blessed empire and turns you into every other nation. Similarly with Qing, I mean, obviously Qing had undertook the greatest uh, territorial expansion in Chinese history, if I'm correct in uh, making that statement. But I think this idea of focusing inwards versus looking outwards is what makes the Ming a unique playthrough. And I think that there should be some sort of detriment to leveraging that incredible power that you have to expand abroad. Now we look at the big bad guy, the Ottomans. They start this dev diary by talking about some of the lessons from the lands of the North. I think it's important uh, if we are gonna be an informed community uh, to be aware of this sort of stuff. So this first point is discussing the fact that uh, branch missions are good, but they're basically saying that the Teutonic Order has half of its missions that are dynamic and they don't wanna do that again. Uh, they also have this, customizable government reforms like the ones in Livonia were a fun experiment, but were a nightmare to create. I have heard this so much. In PDXCon, like half the people I spoke to were talking about how miserable it was for that, which is such a shame because to me, it is the single coolest thing that's come out of EU4. The fact that you can customize your government was incredible and my personal uh, belief is that it was essentially uh, an experiment to see if that's something they would like to pursue uh, in EU5. That's that's my conspiracy theory. I don't know my like tinfoil hat next. I don't know why I'm looking around as if I actually have one. I think the ex existing um, engine isn't suited for it, but it'd be cool. Uh, there is the, also the other thing here, which is it also requires the player to have Wikipedia open in order to get the government reform they desire, which is not optimal. I disagree. I think that's on the players. It's going to be a minority of people who are going to be sitting there going, oh, I want this specific government type. I think it's way more fun and it's on you 
you. If you have Wikipedia open to get a certain, the exact like government you want, I think that's on you. I think you're playing it wrong. I think you should take things as they come and it makes it, makes it more dynamic. So I wouldn't say that that was the game's um, issue. Here we see the uh, highlighting that the government reforms were well received, which I think is great. I think government reforms are awesome, as I've said several times. So many starting points of the mystery can be quite overwhelming. This is something I have heard, so I'm glad that they've taken that into note. Focus on previous immersion packs was too much on mysteries alone. I think that's definitely the case. Kind of felt like Hoi 4, insofar as like a new DLC would bring with it a focus trees. I think that's not our game. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against what we fall, but yeah, that's not that's not what we do here. Uh, so I think this part is key. Unique government reforms, player events, and mechanics. I'm gonna stop highlighting these because it goes in yellow. But anyway, I think those are the things that make uh, the difference. Mysteries are great, but events, uh, government reforms, and, and also formable nations. I think we could definitely get away with a couple more formable nations. This is something that EU4 can do better than most other games. Things like the Latin Empire. Uh, would be great. The Roman Empire is a bit of a stretch, but I'm taking it a couple of steps back from that. Island Confederacy, Federated Governments, uh, th these sorts of things I think would be really, really cool. And the key part is mission trees and the content from Lions of the North made the content outside of the region focus feel very outdated, which is very, very true. I want to say this one thing as well, and I love it in uh, mods like Europa Expanded um, and Antebellum that have this. I really enjoy it when you have these choke points. They're very, very rare uh, in mission trees, but I think it's great. I think having uh, branch mission trees that then come back to this this one like aim is just brilliant because it means that you have to get everything in your country right to get this one thing and then it splits off again. I personally would love to see more of this in future. Having said that, this is a mess. This one starts here. This one starts here. Uh, I, I think they need to restructure it. Like have a scroll down thing. This is that's not nice. All right. We also have an event describing the victory of the Crusade of Honor, which is which is great. I like it when the game starts with this sort of stuff. One of my favorite events, even though it's miserable, is the Crisis of the Maghreb. Uh, which starts with the idea of um, the fact that the Maghreb is going through a crisis and you click the button which is let them try we shall rise again and it really sets the stage. Tunis was one of the first nations I played in EU4. Seeing that um, event later on it really sets the tone of like damn this is this is what I need to do now. I need to like struggle against what's happened. I think it's a really simplistic way that has kind of gone under the radar potentially with some people of setting up uh, the culture of the nation. Something really interesting about the early mission tree is that you get these cannons, right? You can't use them in combat because they don't have any pips yet, but obviously they can be used in sieges. So that's pretty, uh, pretty handy and potentially does reflect the fact that the Ottomans blitz through some places, but I can't, I mean, this is just a huge advantage. It's ridiculous. Sieges win wars in EU4, not battles. I think a lot of players have a misconception about sieges. Siege, the, the siege pips, for example, are way more important than fire pips and, and shot pips for a general. If you can blitz your way through a siege and get it done quick, it's done. This enables you to barrage, right? So think of all the defensive forts in Hungary you can just walk through. But it makes sense. I just want to see how this plays out. Hey, your country name changes to Devlet in Rum. And um, I can't imagine that's going to be pretty to look at on the map. I find that hilarious that one of the claimants to Rome was just some dudes that came from Central Asia, turned up gradually and then just conquered the Byzantines and went, yeah, I guess we're Roman now. But I like the idea of if you go down that side of things, you can you can then just switch your capital to Rome. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like looking at it. I will say one thing. I'm not going to say who it is. There was some discussion I had with some people at PDXCon about there being a decision to change Tunis's name to Carthage. Just the name change, nothing else. Where's that, huh? You know who you are. I'm expecting some DMs on Discord about that. We made a deal. This is getting very personal. Okay, so here we have a new naval doctrine, which I think is great. Uh, it's just another way to add flavor. Um, the British have some. I think the Portuguese also have one as well. However, I do not like the fact that it just means you could raid coasts. That's terrifying. You have any subject in the Maghreb region, you can then raid coasts. Okay, I don't like how many people can raid coasts. I think it's unique to the pirates and the Maghrebi nations. Giving that to the Ottomans as well doesn't make sense. I think instead, the pivot could be, and this can be incredibly hard to rework. So bear in mind that I'm not a developer. I have no experience with this. So I'm just going to say things. But one thing that would be more interesting is if you had a subject um, in North Africa, a Maghrebi subject that would go and raid, that you get a portion of, the, of that income. Because right now, if you, for example, had uh, Tunis as a vassal, Tunis would go and raid and they keep all the money. 
Historically speaking, the Ottomans would definitely see some of that cash. So the Ottomans also get a new uh, subject. Now this is horribly, but an Eilat. It doesn't take any diplomatic relations slots. As you can see here, it gives them tolerance of heathens, tolerance of heretics, uh, cooperation costs, and also national unrest. And it does change their name as well. Not gonna lie, I don't like how long these names are. I I, I mean, I like the idea of changing their names. I, I like all that sort of stuff. But to me, it's gonna sound really strange. It feels weird that all the country names are in English and not of the language of the nation that exists. And then you suddenly have this. Like Spain is called Spain, right? So it seems kind of strange. I'm not like, I don't care really. It's just a curious note that this is more Turkish. Interestingly, they don't get automatically called into war. You need to call them in with favors. So they're more like a, a semi-autonomous vassal, which I really, really like the idea of introducing different uh, vassal mechanics. So this to me is great. I really, really like this change. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, hopefully this serves as a start, uh, at least of different uh, vassal interactions. If we had like a and a merch pack just based on that. Because right now, there is uh, quite a lot of stuff you can do, whether it's a personal union or a march or a vassal. Now we're adding an ILS to it. It really, they're not disappointing on this front, which is great. Interestingly, they do give you the same amount of force limit and manpower as if you were to own them yourself. So it's, it is just a really good way of doing it. More importantly, there's a special Casus Belli of an invasion and you can just turn them into ALETs, which yeah, I really like. Now, uh, here's the part that I think you definitely already knew about with this mission tree. So historically, the Ottomans would conquer the entirety of the Mamluk Sultanate in about two years because the Mamluk Sultanate would collapse. Here, after doing that, we have a special Casus Belli, which can trigger the collapse of the Mamluk Sultanate, which allows you to, to establish a core Eilat in Egypt without causing any aggressive expansion. Kind of terrifying. And then you get Eilat al uh, right there. Yeah, I'm so interested to see how this is going to play out in terms of gameplay functions, because it's one thing to look at it and see, you know, what the inputs and outputs are, but I'm curious to see how this is going to unfold. The I, also, they keep on going more and more in depth. So, for example, you've got Eilat and you've got the special um, Casus Belli, you've got the special Vassal mechanics and everything else, and then even Beyond that, the Mamluk administration means that uh, it's not as good as other islets. And on top of that, we have more stuff to do with uh, the Ottomans being sort of the leaders of the Muslim world at the time. Now, it's worth noting that the now it's worth noting that uh, some of these things are going to be DLC features, and some of these some of these things aren't. We've got the Janissary State and Decadence, as well as the islets, are going to be DLC only features. So the Janissaries, similar to the eunuchs, my thoughts on war estates, not too much of a fan of estates anyway, so we'll see. But it does say here something quite interesting. The Janissary estate is something you'll love in the early game and learn to dislike in the later phase of the game. That it was true historically, so if they're able to actually properly emulate that without it just being a base disaster, that would be cool. I like this though. These privileges are designed to be very powerful, however, they come at a price later on. The Janissaries themselves want their own privileges and can turn these edicts into negative versions of it or demand new privileges entirely. This might make me like estates, because right now, what do estates feel like? To me, at least, they feel like just another extension of a mechanic, right? Like development. You just click a button, it makes it happen. This is the only time I've seen of it feeling like estates are something that have a life of their own, that they are an independent actor within your nation, but that don't share your interests. And I really like that. So if this is implemented like I'm reading, it would be really, really cool because it makes estates, like I said, something uh, with a bit of a life of their own. So decadence is really interesting because it starts to uh, look at something that we've been asking as a community for a long, long time, which was big empires have a way to break apart. This is something that's happened throughout history. And I think that it's going to be so, so cool if they're able to do it properly. It's interesting that they've said that this is a test and they might expand it in future. You gain decadence from negative stability, from being bankrupt, from negative legitimacy, corruption, over government capacity. Bankrupt is an interesting one. Losing a war being an interesting one. It means that you can start to force this potentially. I really like this. Stability cost modifier plus 100%. Technology cost plus 50. Horrible. Liberty desire from subject development plus 100. God, that's all horrible. Positive legitimacy and stability reduce it to a slower degree. But like the reason I bring this up is because for this to happen, you need to have decadence of at least 100, which is then going to unlock. Any of disasters can happen at the same time. Oh, this is going to be great. The Ottomans might actually break apart in future. Those who seek challenge and pain, hello, can trigger the decadence disaster on purpose to unlock the missions which are about handling the many challenges of your empire. Well, that's going to be my first playthrough, isn't it? Feels like I'm just being directly called out in a dev diary. I'm going to quickly whiz through all of these disasters. So we've got the Eilat, Rebellion, pretty standard. Each of them just sort of rise up. And there's anything special to do with that. Decadence of the Pasha, again, you've got loads of separatists um, and trying to deal with that, pretty standard. As well, Plot of the Harem, this is an interesting one because it affects your uh, estates, which could compound horrifically with the Janissary side of things. Um, and as we say that, the Janissary 
coup. That seemed horrible. Idea cost, technology cost, discipline. Oh my God. Yearly army tradition decay, legitimacy, monthly admin, diplo, and mill. Oh. And all granted positive judiciary state projects that convert into negative equivalents. So you've got two ways. You either face them in the Balkans or you negotiate with them. Now, the interesting thing here is that as a result of this terrible thing, you can then get a government reform which gives you discipline plus 10% and you get Western type units. So it might actually be better to go through and trigger it at around the 1600s. Because again, remember what I was saying about pips, tech 12 is when you're at your peak. After that, you start to decline. So maybe hit the tech 12, go on your little rampage and then switch over to Western U um, units and these insane uh, government reforms. Alternatively, you can keep the Janissaries. After completing all the disaster-related missions and the internal power struggle, disaster will end and you'll get the following rewards for all the pain you had to deal with. Gain two in each category. Get the reorganized government, uh, Ottoman government, which gives you Pashas, Janissaries, Aylets, Jan all of the good stuff that you had before, only now you don't have any decadence to deal with. And you get stability cost modifier, admin efficiency, and yearly legitimacy until the end of the game. Oh man, I'm gonna have to do that. God, there's so much content for the Ottomans coming. Now we get to see my favorite aspect of all this, the flavor event. So you get an event for the fall of Vienna and people conversely get horrible, horrible things for the Turkish uh, threat advancing. Just make Austria an outlet. My, my God. We're gonna have to see if that does end up being ridiculously overpowered. Let's go over to Japan. But Japan also gets a very uh, brand new mission tree as well as samurai regiment. They're not easy to recruit and the intention is that'll make about 10 to 25% of your force limit as elite frontline. Now this is the part that I disagree with uh, that I was mentioning earlier. I don't see why Samurai would suddenly have plus 10% discipline. I don't know what made them so incredibly disciplined in comparison to, for example, um, European Knights. Samurai would have just made up parts of the Japanese army in the same way that Knights would have made up parts of the European army. So I'm not sure what the idea is behind the Samurai as a special unit. So maybe I'm wrong here. I'd love for if you're in the comments to uh, counter me on this one, but I don't think that Japan should have special samurai regiments. I don't think it makes sense. Having said that, still a cool feature. Moving on from this, we have uh, some examples of specific uh, missions, each of them giving uh, the same dynamism and new focus on uh, government reforms, which is great. And again, it's just a nice way of uh, really forming the nation yourself. Shintoism itself, uh, I don't, I've never liked the, the way that it has unfolded in E4. Hopefully this adds flavor to a region that for me doesn't have as much despite how much went on at this point. I also enjoy the fact that there is the opportunity to seize land in Korea and China, which is something that Japanese definitely wanted to do. And then you just have Malacca in the Malaccan trade note. I'm not sure where that comes from, but sure. Now this stuff is interesting. What I want to point out is there is a mission here that grants access to the naval hegemon mechanic. Should you complete the mission whilst already a hegemon, you'll gain a special Easter egg modifier called Unleash the Shinkoru, which is cool. Uh, it's sort of similar to the fact that if you insult a stealer's granada, you get a general that's a 60 tradition. If you scornfully insult them, you get a 100 tradition. I'm wondering how that is obvious beyond like just knowing about. So that's something I just know about. There's no tooltip in the game that tells you that as far as I'm aware. That's just something I know. So whilst I like the idea of there being special modifiers, if you've already fulfilled certain criteria, I kind of want it known somewhere that isn't just on the wiki. <laughs> I like the idea that these missions are tied into... Uh, the Shinto uh, level of isolationism. Like I said, my personal belief is that Shintoism is, is not a great uh, faith in EU4 um, and it has the potential to do a lot better just because there's no sliding scale. It's just sort of level three, level four, level two, and they each give wildly different things. I don't really make much sense. It is interesting to see how they've characterized sort of the struggles between Christianity, Shintoism, and the Shogunate and the Emperor. Uh, like, for example, over here, you have Divine Empire tier one government reform, which gives you no stability loss on monarch death, which was in and of itself, it's only one stability, doesn't really matter that much. Like I said, I'm thinking in terms of role play and dynamism terms, I think it's quite cool. The interesting thing is you can get some, some cool stuff like Land of the Christian Sun, uh, which is if Japan, Japan goes Christian. So in all, I've, I've sort of not spent that much time on Japan and that's because there's not really too much to it beyond just the missions and the struggles between the Shogun and the Emperor and obviously Christianity, which I think is really cool. It's a step in the right direction. There's nothing really here to write home about beyond it being updated. Updated. Again, that's really good. I highly urge you to uh, click on the link in the description and check out the different changes for yourself if this is a region that you find yourself uh, interested in playing a lot. Me personally, it doesn't really change the gameplay of Japan. Don't get me wrong, very glad this change is happening. I think it's gonna be cool, but I think you still have the same Japanese gameplay um, without too much of it. It's not like, for example, the Ming or the Ottomans, which is now vastly 
changed. Looking uh, along that theme, we're going to be looking at Russia now. Russia is a really interesting nation to me in the EU4 because it's one of the only nations that I think can genuinely claim to do whatever it wants. And what I mean by that is that you have, for example, the Teutonic Order in, in EU4, which can go and become a step horde and do this sort of stuff, which doesn't really make any sense. Whereas uh, Russia had so many different influences from so many different places, almost became Muslim, courted being Orthodox, was then like the center of the of the of Russian Orthodoxy. It's just it did a lot of different things. You have a lot of different ethnic groups interacting all the time, and so it'll be interesting to see if that is then reflected in Mission Tree. A really interesting thing from a gameplay point of view as uh, Muscovy though into Russia is just the sheer conquest, and it makes sense. And I'm glad that that's sort of the direction they're going for here. Russia as uh, at its core has always been an expansionist nation. You know, contesting the Swedes in the Baltic, uh, they're also in Crimea, then you head east as they're expanding constantly east through all those uh, step tribes in Central Asia, then contesting with the uh, the Japanese in Manchuria, contesting with the, uh, the Chinese. They uh, historically have always looked to expand further. And so I think it's a great thing that's, that's been reflected or the nature of that has been reflected in this in this update. This is something I also want to highlight, this specific quote. An interesting mission uh, would be the early rally of the army mission, as this will define what kind of rush you want to play. And this part here, what kind of rush you want to play, really hammers home that this update is going to be great and I'm going to really enjoy it. The idea is dynamism. The idea is creating your nation state and all those concepts that I've discussed throughout this video, so I won't rehash them, but this idea of like developing the, the fabric of your nation. And I think if they if they are continuous direction they're gonna nail it but we're seeing a lot more of these special units uh, and special mercenary companies and that sort of stuff which i'm never opposed to samurai so i think that'd be really interesting to see and i i do like this sort of stuff where you can establish the autonomous uh, grand duchy and the increased interactions between nations i think it's great it's interesting this part you can form the slavic culture group uniting all slavs into one cohesive culture group i really like that idea and it's something that i think could be more explored in future updates the idea of, of cultures then intersecting and being part of new culture groups i think it's something i hadn't considered before so i think it's really innovative but we do have a trade flow adjustment i know someone ring the bell we've got trade flow adjustment now i know a lot of people don't care about this i do uh, but it does mean that the shift changes everything um, with regards to the trade side of things, especially if you're going to be trying to colonize America uh, at all, especially as Russia. So that's great. But unfortunately, there will not be dynamic trade in E4. I can still dream E5 is coming, lads. This is also something else that's really cool. Uh, this section here. Muscovy is still a tributary state of the Hordes in 1444 and only stopped sending to the Tartars in 1476. This is something that's been ignored in E4 up until this point. So I think having this um is great uh it gives you a reason as the muscovites to smash into the golden horde it doesn't really fit like if you just played e4 and that's where you got your history from playing as muscovy you wouldn't think that you were beholden unto the hordes however historically for the next 30 years you should be paying uh, tribute technically because that's what happened historically so i like the fact that you're getting this malice there it is really interesting that if you refuse to pay it then the Horde can take it by force. I think that's really cool. Suddenly you've got the Great Horde actually being a player. Whilst you can't really make the argument that the Great Horde could have dominated Russia and, and, and become resurgent, they weren't nothing in, in 1444. So I think this does add a bit of a dynamic between the two nations that as of right now doesn't really exist. On top of the other struggles, Muscovy also has the Muscovite Civil War and I'm terrified by how much they're experimenting with this monthly uh, malice to uh, admin Diplo and mill power. It's terrifying. The Russians also have access to Strelsi, uh, which, as you can see here, are a parallel version of the Janissaries. They're going to, it looks like they are going down the, the uh, Janissary route where they're going to demand new salary with every single ruler. Strelsi is something that I don't click. I don't like the fact that it increases your stability cost, and so I don't need them, so I never get them. I'd like to see a change to Strelsi before I do anything like this. Well, actually, having said that, I don't think it's necessary. They, they, to be fair, there is shock damage and shock damage received, so I'll take that back. I think that's actually not a bad trade-off. Continuing with the theme of unique mechanics to these specific nations, we have modernization with regards to Russia. So you can see how much they've westernized. Now, I, anytime you see the word westernized in E4, uh, those of you who've played it a better part of a decade now will instantly feel the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end as we talk about westernization. For those of you who don't know, westernization back in the day was how you changed your tech group before institutions and it was just, oh, it was the worst experience. I'd be interested to see how this works here because it gets it gives you institution spread. Doesn't seem like this is going to be a major defining mechanic and just something that you can play with on the side. I don't think it's going to be too, too important. I could be completely wrong though. Oh no, okay, yeah, this is actually really important. I I didn't read this the first time around. <laughs> so your tech group gets updated, not your unit. Your units will get updated with a later mission. Okay. Also, we also have some more flare events. Ivan the Terrible, 
Pandu Varhanglesk, Rostov on Don over there. The last, I, these are just names that I, anyway, there are gonna be new uh, flavor events, which is great. Uh, and, and different decisions you can take based on that, which is gonna be really, really cool. I also like it when you have to do things like, for example, abolish the serfdom to stop uh, you know, the surf's constantly rising up. It'll be interesting to see how much uh, this relates to Novgorod. Um, if we see right at the start, uh, the discussion is mainly made uh, from Muscovy and the decision is to focus on Muscovy because they're typically going to be the ones that are forming Russia. But there are hints here that forming Russia, Russia as uh, Novgorod and as a republic will yield different results. That does take us to our final development diary, looking at France. Again, this just fits in with the theme of updating uh, mission trees that haven't been updated in a while. 84 new missions, my God. There's there's a lot going on. I want to see some interesting stuff. You can see the change in the flag. Hmm. Yeah, interesting, the start of the game will greet you with a new event. Telling the story of the Hundred Years' War. Again, setting up the setting the scene with an event is just, it's so underrated. But yeah, retaking your cause by freeing and making your cause cheaper, which is kind of interesting, it's kind of it's dynamic. Awarding you more crown land, and then you get the crown of France. So pretty standard at the start. Then we have your interactions with Provence and also the Pope. Again, giving you these different choices to align yourselves or uh, attack uh, in this case up here. I always get nervous when there's lots of different modifiers because you could stack these so easily nowadays. Now this is something that I really like. Get a mission path to conquer Italy if you have good relations with the Pope. You're not conquering land in Italy for France, you're doing it for the Pope, which is a really interesting dynamic because I've never seen that before in a U4 where you are taking land for another nation. I really like that. <laughs> yeah, it offers a lot of options uh, for roleplay. See here, the land's required to be ceded to the papal state domain as well. I like that because France uh, historically had a, a bit of a different relationship with the Pope than other nations in Europe. So it's good to emulate that. And here you can take them as a march. So you can build up the, pa the Papal State and then just vassalize them. Okay, cool. Now here's the part that could get a little bit chaotic. So you can either revive Charlemagne's ambitions or shatter it and take it for yourself. That's being uh, the, the HRE. So you can make a bid for the title of emperor, uh, which will give you diplomatic reputation and all of the electors get an opinion bonus of you, uh, which is terrifying because you should easily be able to become the uh, emperor with that. Our aggressive expansion with the country members of the Holy Empire will be removed. It just gets rid of your aggressive expansion. Whew, that's kind of spicy. If you do everything right and time it, so then you conquer a bunch of stuff. Let's say you conquer just half of Austria. You can then click that and just removes all of the aggressive expansion. Provided you outgrow the uh, emperor in terms of land prestige and diplomatic ability, and secure the electors. It then issues a challenge to the emperor. Their options are either to abdicate, counter their claims, or impose sanctions. They get restoration union yes, well, in France. Interesting. The first option gives the emperorship to France. Second will try to block France's ambitions. And the third will allow the Austrian player to counter the claim and receive a claim on the throne of France. Interesting. This is terrifying. There's a part where you conquer the British Isles and that gives you French Isles. France rules the waves and gains English as an accepted culture. The ship counts plus 20% till the end of the year. The end of the game. Yeah, look, it's a new modifier wants to introduce. I don't even know what it does, but it sounds big. Okay, there is a new French subject type, which is great. This is exactly what I wanted to see, if you recall what I said earlier about the Ottomans. Now, I like this, that they are going to make the liberty desire of the French vassals actually a thing. Because at this time, France was, well, it wasn't really France. It was only after beating the English and the uh, Burgundians going down that you had uh, France as a centralized realm. Historically, for the previous sort of couple of centuries, at least, France itself had been a collection of like a king, obviously, and then its vassals were still very powerful to the point where they could influence the French throne itself. Now, I'm not sure why the French also get the cannons. Uh, it'd be interesting to see why that's the case. I understand the, the, the Ottomans because of the guns of urban, but why, why the French? I'm, I'm glad that they've added in the French Musketeers as a special unit because that does make sense to me. And they've switched out the age of absolutism to Max effective absolute is plus 25%. That also is a really, really nice modifier. I like that. It scales. That's good. Now, this is interesting that, is that uh, Big Boss has highlighted this. Most players don't actually make it to the revolutionary France sort of era. This might give you a reason to. With artillery combat ability plus 10% and movement speed plus 15%, that's pretty decent. Oh, God. Napoleon of Spain. Completing the missions regarding the Peninsula War invading Italy will reward you with powerful new tools root straight from national ideas of countries you conquered. That is such an interesting idea. For example, in Spain case, you'll receive a 10% increase in your morale of army. However, the real twist here is that if you complete these missions with the subject only these regions the subject color will change and reflect yours i really like that should the colors be one-to-one -one representation of the french color or should they be a similar but somewhat different shade of better border uh, readability definitely the latter absolutely the latter and here you're able to uh follow the path of napoleon's internal affairs and recreate some of his accomplishments 
pretty cool. I do enjoy that. France also has a new set of ideas. So let's have a look at that. So you start off with global manpower modifier plus 20% and diplomatic reputation plus one. Okay, development cost at the end of it. Again, pretty good. I don't know where the diplomatic reputation is coming from. I'm not sure what I'd replace it with though. So is that. Lamar plus 15%. So, oh, we don't have the alarm. Wait there, first idea is the, God, the first idea. But to be fair, it's, it's not 20% anymore. It's now 15%, but they also get army tradition. So that's pretty big. War tax cost modifier. That's an interesting one. Don't think I'd use it still. And global tax modifier plus 10%. That's okay. Global unrest minus one. I think global unrest minus one is never a useful thing. It does, it, doesn't, it does not make the difference between there being rebellion or not. We'd also get discipline, native uprising chance, and native assimilation. Or corporation cost and max absolution. I think that's good. And then Revolution France also has its own idea set. It does look like France is going to be an incredibly well fleshed out nation. Right, quite a lengthy video that. Oh man, my back's not day. But that is uh, everything that we have so far on EU4 1.35. Like I said, I can definitely do each one um, individually for each videos, but uh, I, I just thought it'd be better to concentrate this and sort of title it as this is what we know about E4 1.35 so far. So then uh, we can sort of have like a consolidated view of things and we can also spark some discussion uh, in the comments. I think it's good to look at these things holistically versus dev diary by dev diary. So you can start to get an understanding of the overall themes that the team are trying to put into place. So please do let me know in the comments below what you think of EU4 1.35. Are you excited? Are you not? Um, the fact that it's also going to be a DLC. What um, features do you think uh, should be free? Um, is there anything that you're upset about? Is there anything you're looking forward to? That sort of stuff. I'm really interested to see what the community has to say. And I really do think that uh, E4 being what it is, it's heavily reliant on the community. And so I think it's important that we get involved. But yeah, if you did enjoy, please make sure to like and subscribe. And I'll see you all next time. Goodbye. Huge shout out to our patrons, most notably Charlie Demorel, Krilly, Flyerton, JDow52, Cargon, Xiaomi, Lewis Wright, Nicole's Christ, QA Shard, Redguard, and Shadow Singer. Your support means a lot, guys. Whilst you're here, you might as well click on another video. I mean, it's, it's literally right there.